today Jet Black's latest offering for the indoor cycling space, and that is the Vault Smart Trainer. Now this Smart Trainer has a feature I have not seen on any other direct drive Smart Trainers. Stick around for that. Now Jet Black, an Australian company with a number of New Zealanders on staff, who I'm told are just as friendly as us Aussies. Oh yes, the Australian-New Zealand rivalry is never complete without a sheep joke. Now, just after Eurobike 2019, the Jet Black team started from scratch on their next generation smart trainer, leaving behind the Whisper Drive, which didn't rate all that well in the Llama Lab test a few years ago. Effort is not at all what I've set. They are blocks, and what we're riding there is, uh, we're riding camels. Um, the team tell me they've built the vault from the ground up. So onto the unit specifications of the Jet Black Vault. It's a direct drive interactive smart trainer supporting all the things we love, such as sim mode, erg mode, and all of the rest. The bike compatibility, 130 and 135 quick release, and 142 and 148 through axle adapters are supplied with this unit in the box. That makes me happy. The free hub is a Shimano SRAM 11 speed compatible. If you need Campag or SRAM XDR 12 speed, that's sold aftermarket separately. The cassette is supplied on the unit and installed. So it's a Shimano compatible 11 speed cassette with an 1128 gear ratio. The supported connections is absolutely everything. We have amp plus power, amp plus speed, amp plus cadence. We also have amp plus FEC and Bluetooth smart, FTMS. Now, the special feature that this trainer has that I haven't seen on any other smart trainer is a heart rate bridge functionality, bridging a heart rate to the FTMS protocol on the trainer. So there is only one connection to something like the Apple TV. I'll show you that later in the video. Power accuracy claims plus or minus 2.5%. Calibration is done via a spin down, maximum gradient 16%, maximum wattage 1800 watts, flywheel size and weight listed as 4.7 kilos. Doesn't mean much. Similar size to that of the Kicker and Kicker Core. I'll talk about the ride feel later on. Noise level, silent, quiet, less than your drivetrain. That's all you need to know. You'll see that soon too. The power source is from Mains Power, so you need to plug the unit in. And Jet Black have taken things to the next level, putting a Jet Black sticker on the power brick, something other trainer companies really, really need to do when you've got multiple trainers and you don't know what to plug in. So that's a new standard I'd like to see across the board. Thank you. Firmware upgradable via their mobile app with the price coming in in the US at $879 and here in Australia just under $1,200. Putting this trainer in the mid-range price point in the smart trainer market. Availability, Europe, Asia, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, US very soon. So these things are pretty much everywhere. Okay, here's everything that came in the box. We have the unit itself with the cassette installed. We have the legs, we have the bolts for the legs. We have the power kit, the quick release and the through axle adapters. We have a 10 speed spacer. We have the wrench to do everything we need to do to get this up and running and we have the manual. onto the Jet Black mobile app and checking for the latest firmware. The unit's on 2.7, which is the current firmware. All looks good. So here's the magic behind the heart rate bridging that the Vault has that no other smart trainer has. Now going into the properties here, you can see I've paired my Ticker X heart rate via Bluetooth to the Vault Trainer. So what this does is pair the heart rate sensor to the Bluetooth service of the Vault Trainer, meaning that when we load up the Apple TV, as shown here, 
I pair the volt as the power source. I then pair the volt as the cadence source, also as the controllable trainer. And I also pair the volt as the heart rate sensor, leaving one available Bluetooth connection for the Apple TV to connect to something like the Studitzo Smart or other steering devices in the future. I think this is a brilliant value add to a smart trainer and makes it just a little bit smarter than the rest. A few quick turns of the cranks and you'll notice the gear changes are much louder than the Jet Black Volt. So this unit is definitely in the quiet to silent category. And finally, with everything hooked up, ready to go, it's onto Titan's Grove to check out the sim response to warm the trainer up to perform the spin down, and then into the Llama lab test. Okay, onto my notes about the ride experience of the Jet Black Volt. First up, it's quiet. You cannot hear the unit above your drivetrain. Your bike will be louder, your gear changes will be louder, and your music should definitely be louder than this trainer. So there's no need to pull out the decibel meter for this one. The ride feel is good slash excellent. Feels very much like a kicker or a kicker core. Um, probably due to the same flywheel size and internal gearing. So there's nothing really to report about the ride feel. If it's bad, there's a lot to discuss. But it's good enough for me to go, meh, yeah, feels like riding a bike indoors. The unit is stable in sprints, the feet are grippy. I was unable to spin the unit out in a sprint, so I really try and catch that flywheel out, but there's no tricking a physical flywheel. You can't get ahead of it, it's got to spin up. Choose the right gear, you'll get all the sprints you need in this unit done. The sim mode gradient changes through Titan's Grove were responsive, so what I was seeing and what I was feeling was very close, no major lags there. The cadence reporting from the vault was excellent. When I stopped pedaling, the unit reported zero straight away. Very good for getting in the super tuck on Zwift. The erg mode set point changes were fast and responsive. So going from 150 to 450, nice and quick within two seconds. From 150 to 350, same deal, no problems at all there. And following on from that, the erg stability was also excellent. So no major oscillations. And with this unit, unlike the other, there were no camels. So the summary of the ride feel and experience on the bike with the Volt was it was a good ride experience. No problems to report. Next up the data. Let's dig into that. And here we are again on my favorite website on the internet, the DCR Analyzer Tool, where we can compare power and other data from multiple sources as an overlay and see how they stack up. And this makes me pretty happy, but there's more to it. Let's dig in. The Jet Black Volt up against the Power to Max NGCO and the Vector 3s on the bike. So two power benders on the bike, the Jet Black Volt, and away we go. So the first 10 minutes, warm up session, no spin downs done, uh, not too bad. Jet Black reporting a little under, as you'd expect for a trainer being pulled out of the box and being put to use, and it lines up pretty well. So usually I throw that data away, but I just thought I'd just include that to show you that out of the box, it wasn't bad at all. Now during the calibration, there was a small power spike. I am recording the data from a separate device than what I'm doing the spin down on, and who knows what's happening through the air. So I'm going to ignore that 1691 burst right here as an anomaly. But diving into the interesting data, and that is the 200 watt steady state into the 250 watts and into the sprint. And that is looking very 
very good. There's more to it, which I'll loop back to in a moment, but just on a quick visual there, 225, 228, 226, everything is happy, like three peas in a pod for this example here. All looking good for steady state stuff. Holding nice for ERG over those longer time periods. Again, as I said, I'll loop back in a moment. There's more to it than just that. Into the sprint at the end of that 250 watts and all looking pretty good there. There's a little phase shifting from one of the meters. That was the power to max in GECO. But you can see there it's not overshooting. It's not undershooting by a lot and it's not continuing on doing what's that I am not doing. So that all looks really, really good with zero second smoothing on there. So it's all raw data. Into the overs and unders which we have here, which is 150, 350, 150, 350, 150, 450, 150, 450, and 150 again to finish that off. And it's all looking really, really good. No overshoots, no undershoots, holding ERG nice and stable for that short 20 second effort. The only criticism there would probably be going from 150 to 450, it was really quick. But if you're doing 450 watt ERG zones, you're gonna have to be prepared for the pedals to kick back at you. So nothing really negative to report there. It was just really responsive and that's a good thing. So. All looking really, really good there. Next up, the surprise packet, the flywheel speed test, and the Volt passed this. It, I don't design this for trainers to pass this test. Slower flywheel speed with a 225 watt set point, and then after 90 seconds, I change gear and bring the flywheel speed up. Nothing else changes. Still holds pretty stable through here. And then I put it into the 5311 or the 5212 or the biggest gear that I have on the bike, and that's where trainers usually fall apart that's okay. Trainers don't usually have a working zone of a massively fast flywheel to hold ERG. This did, and it passed the test. Now I did ping Jet Black on this saying, are you doing anything tricky here at all? There was a bit of a chuckle on the other end of the phone because they'd done a ton of work for this particular area, making sure the unit works with higher flywheel speeds in ERG, and you can see the data here, it does. And finally on this ride, two short, sharp, hard hill jams. Not quite sprints, they are hard, almost sustained efforts, simulating an attack in a race or maybe a surge, up to around 700 watts here, spiking at around 900 here, and you can see there, all looking good, no major separation whatsoever, that's a tick from me on that. Before diving down today's rabbit hole, I'll pull up the cadence data, and nothing to report there either. All looking really good, the cadence estimation from the vault is absolutely brilliant when compared to the Powdermax Ngico and the Vector 3. So with a graph looking that good, you're probably wondering where today's rabbit hole is going to take us. Well, let's jump back to the 200 and 250 watt zone and look a little closer to see what we can find. And you might be able to see it, you might not, but let me point that out for you. There's a small amount of drift down on both on-bike power meters with the jet black vault, which is the control, staying the same all the way across. So I think we're looking at a little bit of thermal drift based on what I'm seeing just here. More data required. Pulling up data set number two from ride number two, focusing on an area that was identified in the Llama Lab test, ride number one, that needed a little more attention. And this is what we have here. This is very similar to the test that I put the Magine T300 to on stage three of Tour de Zwift. Now there was no spin down coloration done for this ride. I'd ended my previous ride with a spin down, so I just wanted to leave everything as is, which is a standard use case, and just ride. Same power meter, same bike, same trainer, same everything else, and away I went up the reverse KOM on Zwift. Early on in the ride, the Volt was rooting a little under the Vector 3s and the Power to Max NGCO, which was not really to be unexpected given it was spun down at a much higher temperature. So I waited, I waited. Just here, quite a bit of separation there at a lower flywheel speed and a higher wattage, which was a concern. Then things kind of came into line there. But the real test was putting that 300 watts down up the reverse KOM. Diving into that data right here. And we can see the averages aren't too bad. So the two power meters agree within almost half a watt. The jet black volt, a little higher, but what's happening there it was under reading and then started over reading near the end, indicating there is a little bit of thermal drift happening here. So the purple line through here indicates the jet black volt a little under. As things warm up and probably get to around the zone that was spun down in on the previous ride, things agree, it's all okay. But as time moves on, things get a little hotter and a little hotter, and these trainers do get very hot. This was, what are we at, around 300, 320 or so. It shifts its power to reading a little high and a little over the true power on the pedals. And through here, for the last few minutes, 
it was reading around 15 watts too high, which is just a little bit beyond the 2.5% power accuracy that I'd like to see. And then right at the end, something happens. It comes back into line. I'll just fix the zoom on that by selecting this section through here. Here we go. So it's off a little bit through here. Then it comes good for around about the same power. Now what had happened there was the gradient really topped off and I changed through some gears, spun things up, same effort, better power, which indicated there was an issue with lower flywheel speed and higher power efforts. Hmm, I think I've seen that before somewhere else recently. So to test that again on the way down, here's another little sim gradient here where the power is reading higher. And then I stopped, changed the slider to 50% which allowed me to change down through the gears a little bit on the bike physically. And then surprise, surprise, with a higher flywheel speed, the power numbers came into line. So from there, the rest of the ride was done at the trainer difficulty of 50%, allowing for a higher flywheel speed. And diving into that data here, that all looks really good. I performed another short, sharp, hard sprint jam through the castle on the cobbles. No separation through there, everything looks really good. And then all the way home, Pushing to around 200 watts, everything is looking really, really good. So this makes it two data sets that indicate the Jet Black Volt has a slight issue with thermal drift. Again, depending on where things were spun down. And it's also something to do with the flywheel speed at higher power. Something for the engineers to dig into, and they have this data to do that with. Now onto my general observations of the unit as a whole. Packaging was excellent. It comes in a giant egg carton, which is recyclable. That thing could bounce down the road, no problems at all, and you'd still have a trainer that would work, I'm sure. The videos Jet Black have published over on their YouTube channel pretty much put me out of a job. They've got videos on how to change the through axles to the quick release, to the heart rate connections through, even building the unit. So as I said, it's putting me out of a job. I like that, absolutely. They're how-to guides that every company should do. The unit does need some manual labor to put together. Now I'm a big supporter of just pulling things out of the box and having them just work, but there's only four bolts with this, so I will give it a leaf pass. It's easy to do and the tools are supplied. Oh, f where did it hit you? My hand. Sorry. Having the cassette already installed on the unit saves people from having to go back to the store and getting a lock ring tool or a chain whip or even knowing what those are. So that's a good thing there too, having that pre-installed. The quick release and through axle adapters being supplied in the box, that's the standard they should hit, and they have indeed. The Vault has no ability to adjust the leveling of the feet. Now, I don't see this as a problem with the current design because it has a four point foot design that are spread out. The other trainers which have a center line balancer and two swing arms do need some kind of balancing some of the time. So with this, four feet, no problems at all in the Llama Lab, the floor is flat. The Bluetooth heart rate bridge is brilliant and it makes the smart trainer a little bit smarter. The app in iOS is a little clunky, but the only thing I used the app for was spin down and the firmware update check and that was fine. Jet Black do tell me they're working on a new version of the app for iOS and yes, I have seen the reviews of the Android version of the app too. It's not pretty, but they also tell me they're working on a new version of that. For the majority of users, it's simply connecting to the app, do the spin down, jump over to Zwift, Trainer Road, RGT, you name it, and ride. This unit will do that with all the supported connections. The spin down value is stored on the trainer. There's no need to continue to do that once it's been done for probably a few weeks. So the biggest issue that I had with the Jet Black Vault was that thermal drift going from cold to hot. And when it was hot, it liked a higher flywheel speed than those lower flywheel speeds as you saw in the data before. But having said that, it's nothing on the 50 watt drift that I saw on a trainer in the Llama Lab last week. So the Vault isn't a perfect trainer, but it is a world of difference away from the Whisper Drive, the previous generation from Jet Black. And the ultimate goal here would be to see that trainer within plus or minus 2.5% across all use cases. Okay, wrapping this one up for today, there we have it, my experience with the Jet Black Vault in the Llama Lab. Now, the data you saw before indicates they're punching well above their weight up against the big four in this space, but they've got a little bit of work to do with that drift. They tell me they're on it. They've got all the data that you've seen today. So I'll keep on them and I'll keep you updated. So stay tuned. Thanks for watching.